like to practice. I mean, I do it, but I don't really like to practice. I don't like to practice <laughs> just because it's work. <laughs> but I do it. I mean, I practice a lot because I have to. We have so much repertoire we have to learn. The whole point of practicing is, um, is, is just problem solving. So, I mean, basically, what's on the page here is just, like, a big, a big problem <laughs> that needs to be solved, both technically and musically. We're in training like an athlete would be for, we're doing it for a concert, they're doing it for the Olympics or something like that. A lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of physical um, effort involved as well, and, uh, if, if we let our fingers, you know, rest for a day or two, they haven't touched the instrument, they actually lose touch, they lose their, uh, their agility, their um, suppleness. If you really need to learn a piece, you need some, some calmness, I mean, where you can actually just do some hours a day, rehearsing it very calmly without having the feeling that you have to peak in a week on it. It's an art to know how to practice. It's really a skill to know when to stop. And I mean, when you're, when you're just not concentrating anymore, when your mind starts wandering. And I mean, it's a skill to organize, organize all the materials that you need to cover. Um, just, just finding, just finding um, smart ways to, and efficient ways to solve problems so you aren't in the practice room for you know, for too long. <laughs> it's, just, it's, not, it's not good for your body either. <laughs> there is a certain routine to things and you start to become very in tune with yourself, with, uh, with your body, with your playing ability and you know that if you let that slip you can, you can really feel that. It's only a subtle difference but it's something that, that we can really feel. It's like learning to walk. You have to you have to learn to walk before you can walk around enjoyably, just to have a nice walk. In, in all of the arts, to, to uh, hone something down so that it becomes what you want to say, so that it looks simple, so it makes people think, why didn't I think of that? Then that's, that's the goal of, of making good music, of painting a good painting, so, of uh, Seeing a gymnast fly through the air, they make it look so simple, so easy. And it's the same for us, the working process, so that it becomes something that is, is uh, easy to understand and looks simple and seems natural. By the time we get to the concert, we have to have all those things fine-tuned. Concerts are deadlines. I mean, a concert is, I mean, when you walk on stage, when, as soon as you walk out that door, there's no excuse. To go back to the Olympic analogy, I mean, you only get one race, and if, if you're not right there for that race, and centered, and ready to go, and uh, you know exactly what's going to happen, then, I mean, you're not going to and try halfway, you're not going to put in a little bit of effort, you're going to apply everything you have towards that. And it's, it's similar to play a concert. When I'm practicing my quartet part, I would be thinking about how that particular, my one line, would fit into the whole, the big picture. 
you can't know until you go into a rehearsal uh, what exactly the other's going to do. And then when you go into a rehearsal and you find everyone is doing something completely different, that's when <laughs> things get exciting. <laughs> Once again, once again. That's good. And what dynamic are you? Um, pianissimo. Two piece? Yeah. Can you be a little more? I think it's okay now. Yeah, it's better. It's continuing now, actually. Yeah. Continue. So let's continue now. This bowing? Now that we've got it, let's continue. Oh, okay. Do you want to keep doing You want to do separate bows now? Sure. Quartets have been um, likened in the past to um, marriages, and I think that's really true. Instead of having uh, one person decide what they like to hear themselves, we all have to add to a pot, so to speak. And so that takes a bit of time and takes a bit of understanding. It's very different than, than just, you know, you know, having to resolve yourself and this piece of wood. You're having to resolve yourself and your, own, your piece of wood and three other people and their, their pieces of wood. <laughs> um, I, so we, we, we're essentially going to play that off? We, we try our best to meet for four hours a day, six days a week, um, which, really, which really is a lot. I personally find it very wearing. I mean, just even to see them every day. <laughs> well, we're the fellowship quartet in residence at the University of Maryland. The fellowship involves a doctoral degree for all four of us, so we take classes here. We get involved in the community in the school through uh, playing in the University of Maryland Orchestra. You try to do it every other day when you play an instrument. It's really good to have. Uh, Especially the upper body for a violinist to train other muscle groups. An additional really good thing about it is also that you, if you really focus on your breathing, you get exactly the same breathing patterns as you need in playing. I don't think anybody can quite live, eat, sleep, and breathe music. I mean, it's part of you all that, all, all those, when you're doing all those things. But um, me personally, if I just did that, then I think I'd go a bit nuts. I did, I did make the choice that if there was a time to do music, it was right now. But I don't think that means that I dropped everything else out of my life. Do you find there's always one or two screws left over? I hate that. Well, I, I worked as an architect for six months back in Australia. And uh, that was a nine to five, nine to five job. And you'd, I'd do extra, extra bits of work at night and stuff for, for other clients. But the funny thing is, I, th I thought I was busy then. But but now that I feel like I'm on holidays, I'm actually much busier. This is uh, it's not the first house I've done, but it's the first house I've done on my own. It's the way most architects get their first house done, actually, <laughs> like mummy and daddy. <laughs> I had never really thought about being a cellist. I'm not sure what I wanted to be. No, I wanted to ride horses, that's what I wanted to do. Because I loved being around horses. Well, I started the cello when I was eight. Um, I was in the public school system in New Jersey, in the third grade, and they had this, they handed out a piece of paper that said, that had a picture of a violin and a viola and a cello. And they said, if you pay $15 a month to rent this instrument, we will give you lessons for free. And so, and I remember being really excited <laughs> and that I wanted to play the cello. I don't know why, I'm not sure that I'd even seen one before. And I just, I ran home, told my mother, 
Mom, I have to play the cello. I want to play the cello. And, uh, and she looked at the sheet, and it was like $17 a month for, to rent the cello, and it was like $11.50 a month to rent the violin. And so my mother said, and they were kind of strapped for cash at that, that time. And so my mother said, oh, are you sure you don't want to play the violin? It's, you know, a very popular instrument. Everybody likes the violin. And I was sure that I didn't want to play the violin. It's funny, there, a lot of people have stories about, um, you know, having heard it when they were really little and always wanting to play it. But, but for me, I don't know, just one day I just spontaneously wanted to, um, I just told my parents I wanted to play the violin. I don't know, there's all this stuff about child prodigies and that type of thing where um, there's these 14 year olds that, you know, can play the most difficult concertos. And I felt a little behind on that, of course, so I had a little bit of catch up to do. So I, you know, just worked pretty hard and I wanted to do that while I was younger. So that was the push then. And um, basically I haven't looked back since. That was what, four years ago now. I always felt a little bit weird carrying my cello around. I mean, people always looked at me strange when I was carrying my cello around, which is why after the first year of playing cello, I wanted to play flute because it was smaller and I could hide it in my bag if I walked to school. It's, uh, yeah, it's like my right arm or my ear or my left foot. Then this has <laughs> almost become a part of that. Hasa and I live together. Um, it's sometimes it's hard to separate the the work and the home because we spend so much time together. Um, but we try to leave tensions from the rehearsal at you know there and not bring them home and leave our tensions from home, leave them at home. And sometimes it's hard, but we're learning to deal with it. No, I, I'm glad I wasn't there for the beginning of the romance. I think that would have been too complicated. <laughs> I mean, if I were in Amy's shoes, I would, I, it just wouldn't work for me. Steve and I both feel like it's very much of their private. I mean, we don't even want to know about it. <laughs> Watch see on the vent right there on that downbeat. Okay. Um, um, and maybe we can have sort of a like motion so that it's not because it's hard to know. I'm trying to do now. I'm trying to do. That's good. That's good. We all get used to that swinging motion together. I think. Yeah, but just let's keep watching out for yeah. the first um, one. We, we never um, <laughs> adjusted that first F sharp there. The yeah, I know. It's sorry. It's done. <laughs> It's really hard to... Is that a big finger? finger? Yeah, I tried to find one. It's this is really awkward. It's really... Yeah. Not, it looks like you're shifting down from a finger above, below on a different string. Is it? I don't know what you're yeah, but see, the, um, yeah. On a daily basis, I have to work with people that, that sometimes really annoy me. <laughs> and I have to, you know, have to deal with it because we're, we have a purpose to make music. Playing together with three people from three other cultures is, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a, an enlightening experience. A string quartet, it's like, um, I think it's like a condensed civilization because, or a condensed society, because there are all these people with very, very strong feelings and with all of their own backgrounds, their own uh, ideas about things. And, and then they get together and they sort of have to work it out. Um, let's go back. Back to where we started at the beginning of the rehearsal, and just to tie and it just down. To yeah. Actually, yeah. can we go into my, uh, since we're around this area, I want to get those chords going into my solo. Yeah, sure. Mm. Go from 110, <laughs> upbeat to 110. Yeah. I still can't do my pitch. Mm. What, upbeat into 110? Yeah. yeah. The whole quarter? Yep, the whole quarter. Okay. Happen in the rest? I feel like we're sort of wait, wait. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no I mean, velocity. I mean, there's no momentum yeah. now. So. 
And it doesn't it doesn't feel like that it that one of them's on the middle of the bar, one yeah. of them's on the on upbeats. the end of. See, that feels like a downbeat, not an end. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Now I'm really faked out. Well, I, I can't give a down if I. I don't know how. That's it. No, that's see, cues, cues like the downward never ever. <laughs> they, they just never work. <laughs> this just looks stupid. <laughs> I was just wondering if it could sound like, just for a split second that the bow is slower, so it goes with my. I think that's just us doing. Don't break it before us because then it just sounds like a mistake. <clears throat> if it comes, we. If you, yeah, yeah I think you break it, on. break it uh, on the beat. No, that's just okay, the three of us do that now. last, the last chord. Could could we feel the last chord that it comes uh, early, earlier than it should? Comes it's earlier. Wait, 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 wait. We have about ten There's different things going on here. Let's try one thing at a time. Isn't it? So well, let's I mean, just try it's, it's an upbeat. I, I mean, I'm talking about the feeling of it being an upbeat instead of being on the downbeat, which it's meant to sound like. It's meant to sound like an early downbeat. That's true. It sounds kind of like. Like the down All of them sound like downbeats. Well, one is, right? Yeah, only one of them. Only oh, there's a downbeat? Something about the body language. Yeah. Uh, our rehearsal today was pretty rough. I hate being unprepared for a rehearsal. It just feels dirty. A lot of times we do spend a lot of our time as a quartet learning our own parts. <laughs> I mean, it's very important to come in and um, and know your part. I mean, know your part, be able to play your part. It's really frustrating when one person has to keep stopping because they haven't learned their part, and you know. <sighs> Music is, is, is something that you take in. It's like food for the ears. Music is a language. Music is, um, it's a means of expression. It's a, it's a way of saying something that you feel. It's a way of uh, promoting thought. And I guess music is turning noise into something that's beyond sound. It has to have structure of some sort, even if it's not um, pre-planned structure. It's making it something that could be interpreted or understood. It's probably the same as it is for many other people. It's something that you connect with and love. Well, they're notes. <laughs> and there's a structure and there are harmonies. I don't know, it's made up of different harmonies, different rhythms. A one, two, three, one, two, three. Sort of like stacking a sandwich. You might have different, um, a whole bunch of different um, pitches, and you can stack them all together. And if you combine them, there's an infinite number of combinations, and each different combination will say something slightly different in a different way. You can have like only ham, or ham and cheese, or you know, different. You can just stack them up, and, and it will create a chord, which is like a triple-decker sandwich or something like that. And you can tell some basic things just by looking at the score, what key it's in, um, how many sharps and flats it has, um, whether it's a major or minor key, you can see if it's slow or fast, uh, if, it's, um, if it's going to be light or really heavy and loud. Forte or fortissimo, it's a good Italian word. Um, means to be loud or, you know, the loudest is the fortissimo and piano or pianissimo are the two quiet ones. It's all the details and the sum of those details that makes it satisfying. A little more snap to it. Well, we see the Guneri guys every month for two days. They're coaching us on uh, the repertoire that we've worked on over the month. Well, I think it's good for a young group like us to, to see not only 
not only have coachings with them, but um, also to see how a really established, legendary quartet like them, how, how their group, di group dynamic is and how they're so different among the four of them. And don't ever come back. <laughs> As you make this beautiful the way you play it, a dom, and you relax the vibrato and the diminuendo, da 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 ya ba ba. That's, that's you know, very, very beautiful, extremely gorgeous. Yeah, if you could, again, you're doing it with a bow, but that you're not lazy with the vibrato, right? Then, then it really, you know, yeah. you'll wake. You'll wake us up in the audience if you do that. Well, you, you, the, the, I don't clearly understand your what the phrasing you intend to make. Can add a little more space for that eighth rest. Okay. Now sustain it a little more. Finish. No, but then make them anyway. Well, the Guarneris are they're they're just from another generation. They're they're like gods in the music world. Now you went we also have private lessons with the Guarneris, and uh, we are able to work on more specific quartet issues in that point. It doesn't even have to be such an exaggerated motion. Just be aware that the left elbow can help. We've spoken of that, yeah. I, I remember, in the past. Yeah. Supporting the hand from below, mm -hmm. so that you're not putting the entire burden of that little extension with the fourth finger on the hand alone, but you're helping support it so the hand appears rounder, in other words, I would cross over. That's right. Mm -hmm. Look, it's not a pretty melody. No, he says mit Kraft. What's important is that it be very sturdy and even a little bit crude sounding, or a little ugly is very, very good. I can do that. Well, good. <laughs> All right, but don't be shy about it. Would you mind starting it again? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice when when second is playing ha, 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 that you not lose even though you're underneath dynamically that you not lose the that syncopated feeling of the accents I don't really hear that that you bring that out yes. you know? yeah. do it again Do it again. That's right. That's right. But, but the half notes may be somewhat longer. Okay. Can you give a little bit of a a little bit of a zing on that trill? With the bow. Just a little bit.
Okay, now it's good, but she's out playing you. You know, her, all her, all her, um, all her phrases, all her ideas are a little bit more outgoing than you, and she's she's really uh, she's leaving you in the dust. Huh. She, it should be the other way around. The violin should be the sparkling part of this. Uh -huh. Why not? Why not use a G string here just for strength? Yeah. Yeah. yeah see, the D string's a little weak, but you can do something on the G string there. Mozart okay. wouldn't have minded. He might even like that. Always looking for new things is one thing, but there's a lot of things in the world that have already been discovered, and um, there's something about reinventing things. I always remember when I, when I was an architect, we, we were um, told to go away and design a coffee cup. And then he said, okay, I was just sort of pulling your leg that week. I didn't really want you to design a coffee cup. I want you to go away now. And what I want you to do is design a way to get caffeine into the body. And essentially, that's the same as asking you to design a coffee cup. But to look at it another way and say, okay, skip the coffee cup. That's been done. I want you to find a way to get caffeine in the body. There were some amazing ideas that come out of that kind of thing. Playing old music is a similar type of thing. I mean, sure, everybody, a lot of people, thousands of people have played Beethoven quartets. We can't quite reinvent a Beethoven quartet. We can't, but the thing is, it's fresh every time. It's new, it's different. You'll hear something, you'll, you'll see something, you'll, um, you'll feel something different every time. And uh, that's one of the reasons that music really attracts me and keeps me, you know, excited. Completely uh, Russian. I don't understand. This feels like Russian there. You mean? Can you? Let's, let's just listen to the end again. We don't need to know where that starts from. But that's the thing. Is that no, I know this. The, the, go um, from two minutes and nine seconds. I'll tell you where we are. Yeah, I think the other one was. You can't do it again because it is tricky. The John Adams piece, the John's Book of Alleged Dances, is written for string quartet for acoustic string quartet um, with electronic sampler tracks. So we have a CD for that, and we have to play along with it. You know, when it starts, we just have to keep up with it. It's good discipline, I guess, in, in one sense. Um, and, and it's a lot of fun, because uh, it's always grooving, so it makes you groove. <laughs> No, I think it, we were behind. No, it rushes at the 916. This is one, two, three. I don't know how I was already behind. Two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. It was on. It was on up to 122. I thought with the thing. Uh, maybe could you uh, tap in the three hmm. or something? Because I can try. It's, it's hard to feel the three. Without I know. I know. Yeah, it's, oh. it's true. So if you could keep it going. I remember now um, when it starts the bone clicking. Yum, bum, bum, bum. 
boom. The, the boom comes a little bit sooner than the downbeat. I mean, than the whatever beat it's on. Dum -ba -dum -bum, boom. Dum -ba -dum -bum, boom. I think it. Or maybe it's like what happened in the beginning. Okay. I think we rock at the end, but yeah, it's yeah. not stable, the rest that's of for sure. Yeah, it's actually kind of fast. Yeah, it felt faster, yeah, but it's not steady, that's the thing. Well, it's just doing it. No, but we have to do it, that's why we're practicing it. Yeah. I did. I think that was if, right. If we it's just never stay, felt that way just, before. Just <laughs> it's because we rushed before. That's what I've they never all felt say. that way it's before. I've never felt that way before. <laughs> I want to see if I can follow the score this time. The problem around 80 is that we can't hear the click. Yeah, track. it's true. It's true. I can't hear the click. Down.
your life is so much simpler on tour because uh, you've left everything that you have to do at home and you've left that at home and uh, it's, it's gone. And as soon as you get on that aeroplane, it, you can almost breathe a sigh of relief and well, have a beer. Well, you're usually tired and jet lagged. <laughs> <laughs> and in Denmark, you're full of, full of cheese and bread. <laughs> There's something about sharing uh, between different cultures. I mean, whether we're speaking, but we're speaking through an international language almost, and that is music. And, um, you know, people get what they want out of our music, and hopefully it's what we want them to get. But, you know, sometimes they get, they, they, they f see other things and, and feel other things and uh, hear other things than, than maybe what we intended. And that's one of the great things about music, that people's imagination can run wild. The first time I went to, to Denmark, when we went last tour, it was very interesting for me to be there, just and especially to be in this, this little town where Hesse grew up, because it was, oh, it was just interesting, I mean, knowing Hesse before and then, and then seeing where, where he kind of um, spent his childhood. And I, I, I wouldn't have guessed it, actually, because it, it he, he grew up in a very small, I've never been in a, a, such a rural, a sort of fishing village right on the a fjord and I mean it's so idyllic and, and beautiful there and he just seems he always struck me as a very cosmopolitan person it's just it's just very very interesting to see that he came from such <laughs> actually was a country boy at heart <laughs> doing a bit of a, uh, I guess, a, uh, a run through of the atoms to sort out with our sound engineer, see what, um, we're going to play it with headphones instead of last time we used, um, we used stage monitors, so we're going to see if we can cover just one ear and hear each other out the other ear, and instead of having to pick up mic on the instrument here, we're going to use these freestanding cardioid microphones. And, um, and so mainly because of that, we're not using the monitors, but we're using the headphones so that there's no leakage into them. It looks like the equipment is great, so, so we would, I think the sound is going to be just spectacular tomorrow. So we're really looking forward to it. Just like Madonna, except we won't have the little mouthpiece, you know. Other than that, I feel like a virgin. <laughs> great thing and often a rare thing that, that classical performers get to meet their maker, so to speak, meet the composer of the music. Quite good, very good, yeah. But I must ask you two to play a little less. <laughs> Maybe it's no, 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 because uh, the room uh, doesn't exaggerate only violas. <laughs> it exaggerates everything. No, you cover them uh, quite often. And it, for me, it's for my taste mon goût, it's a little too brutal, yeah. I mean, very strong, this is a very powerful meal, but it must be not 
like explosion every time. <laughs> play once, just uh, play the notes. I want you to hear the chord that I wrote there. Just play the notes without any rhythm, just the G sharp octave. And you see, that's what I want to hear. So it's, it's not just a you know, it's baba. Yeah, so you must hold a little longer. Now, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, what's, what's going on here? Play, play your notes after. Oh, I want to play on my notes. Yeah, I hear a minor third, I want to hear a second. Oh my goodness. How can, how can you? <laughs> are, you, are you trying to test my ears? <laughs> she's, she's blushing. <laughs> to have him there and, and say what, what he thought, um, was, was really enlightening. You know, I'm an alta caca now, as they say. I'm almost 75, and I remember the days in, when you played with Reiner and Toscanini, and, and I played with all them. You, you didn't, one didn't do that. Everything has gotten kind of loud in the world. You know, rock music, uh, you know, everything's louder. So you young people, you are like victims of it. You don't, know, you don't even know what it was like when we played pianissimo, or when we played what we call the decent forte, you know. And I hear lots of string quartets, they sound, you know, they, they play very loud, and then the engineer makes it sound like they're playing Strauss's Alpine Symphony, you know. <laughs> so if you shoot your wad in the forte, you got nothing. <laughs> All right. We got a glimpse into his world. And I mean, he's got jazz coming out of all his pores. And that was something that we hadn't we thought about when we were, were working a little bit before we met him, but, but it was really so evident, just that's the way he thinks. He's a jazz man. That was a little too rough. Because otherwise it sounds like chopped sausage, you know? <laughs> Even without my being a jazz musician, I have a certain classic sense of the weights, W-E-I-G-H-T, of the beats, you know? And the fourth beat is always a weaker beat for me. One is the king, three is the queen, two is the cabinet minister, and uh, four is the minister of culture. <laughs> so, so, therefore, it should not sound like, you know, like a one, yeah? And therefore, it has a feeling of bon, down, up. Now comes the strongest beat, which you which don't play. Yeah, which is That's the idea. Right. I think it is important to understand what the motivations of the composer were at the very beginning because he's, he or she is the, the source. See, these are things nobody can write. I mean, I could write a 10-page essay about this, you know, but nobody would read it anyway. So I was actually know. getting a little worried during, during the coaching. I mean, it was such a lot of information. I knew we had to play it the next day. And I said, you know, this is totally going to tie me in knots because I'm going to say, I have to think in eight, you know, and I'm not going to have... I, I was just worried that I wouldn't feel free in the concert. And so I asked him, I said, um, is it all right to do some rubato here or there or whatever? And he said, as long as it's done with taste and conviction, I'm all for it, you know? And, and I really appreciated that. I mean, he's, he's so adamant about so many of his, uh, his viewpoints, but, uh, but uh, he's, it was really nice of him to, to uh, give, us, give us that. <laughs>
here in the beginning, it's just, this is, this is where it all starts. It's, it's totally, we don't know where we're going and it's, it's so sad. It's just funny because I look at something like this and we sit, we rehearse five or sometimes six hours a day and you're just staring at something like this, just staring at it for hours on end. And sometimes I sit back and it just boggles my mind. What the heck is this? Why does, why does this mean something to me and why am I sitting here for so many hours? I think, you know, music itself can look complicated just like, I mean, let, let's look at a computer. We can all play a computer game. But if we all were meant to understand the programming of that game, I mean, most of us wouldn't know where to start. I mean, dude, it's, it's taken somebody years of hours of work every day to, to write some of these complex programs. And, um, you know, we don't actually all have to understand it to appreciate using that program. And, uh, and it's, it's very similar in music. We don't all have to understand the written code of music notation. Music, the way it's on the page, is so much like... Um, it's like a text. I mean, if you were going to read from a play or something, you look at the script. When you're taught to read and write, there are certain rules like... Um, you know, you've got to put a U after a Q and things like that. It starts getting really complicated. But if you're just going to stand somewhere and talk, you don't have to think, oh, I'm going to say quintessential now. Q, U, I, and I mean, you don't have to spell it out. You don't have to break it down. There's a flow to it. There's something about it that um, it's gone beyond a written language. Uh, so it's the same with music. Um, we we read the notes, um, but anybody can understand the music. As a musician, you have to get behind that printed matter and try to find where the composer is more agitated or more tender or more aggressive or more uh, jubilant. The print and the page is, is the uh, composer's manner of uh, explaining what he would like heard. He knows how to manipulate harmonies and manipulate melodies to make you feel a certain way. You bring it to life with, I mean, with, with, your, with your knowledge of the instrument and, and you use the sound and modulation of sound just the same way that you would read something out loud and, and give it inflection um, so that it is understandable to the audience. Um, and then, and then here, this is a, this is a, this is a, such a lonely theme where the cello comes out and plays the theme. And this is where, uh, this is a variation, this is sort of we're heading off into the, into the woods. This is, a, this is a beautiful moment here. How would you know that?